Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Welcome, all of you, and thank you for joining us tonight for this special event featuring RISD alumni who carry on the spirit of generosity begun in 1877 uh, by RISD's founder, Helen Adelia Rowe Metcalf. <clears throat> Each of our presenters and our hosts this evening have committed themselves to empowering underserved communities in a number of ways, and tonight they will share with you their inspiration, challenges, and the passion that sustains them. Before we jump in, I'll share a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, you have all been muted for the presentation and we encourage you to post questions in the Q&A feature and we'll do our best to answer them in the second half of the program. Our panel tonight is moderated by Lena Sergi Attar, a graduate of the Masters in Architecture program at RISD in 2001. Lena is a Syrian American writer and architect from Aleppo. She's founder and CEO of Karam, a foundation for the future of Syria. Karam's work focuses on unleashing the potential of young Syrian refu refugees through innovative and creative programs. Lena has been leading a conversation with alumni Tino Chow and Sarah Durham about bringing RISD alumni together to launch a RISD serves committee. Um, but she's gonna talk about uh, that a little bit more um, in a minute. I'll let her take it over from here. Thank you, Chris, and it's such an honor to be here, and I always love anything to do with RISD. I wish we were having this panel in person in Providence because I'll always take any excuse to be in Providence again. It's like a second home to me, so I'm very excited to be on this panel, and actually this is a very meaningful pa panel for me as well because it's the first um, first event we're doing as RISD serves and hopefully it'll be the first in a series of events that we can talk about uh, service and how RISD people are serving their communities and how we can do more of that. So this is an important subject to me personally because this is what I work in. I run an organization called Kerem Foundation. And as Chris said, we serve Syrian refugees. Uh, but today, because we have a RISD audience, I wanted to go back to a little bit of the roots of how this came to be and why we do what we do. And that will go back to the first day I came into RISD. I say this in a lot of my talks about Syria and people are usually confused about why, does, why is this relevant? But the first day I walked into the BEB, into the architecture studio, I remember um, there was, we met everybody, we went to lunch, we came back from lunch, and, I, and then I came back in the room and every single desk had this 25 pound bag of clay. And there was one thing to do, which was to make a joint out of clay. And I'd come from Syria. Um, I had graduated from architecture from Syria at the top of my class, which I tell you this only to serve the story, which is I had no idea what to do with the clay. And not only did I not know what to do with the clay, I didn't know what to think about doing for the clay. And I saw how everybody else reacted and everybody just started doing it. And people had amazing ideas and some people had ordinary ideas, but they weren't paralyzed inside by me. And, um, and I went home and I was very, very crushed by this experience. And I realized that I was missing so much in just the way, the thought process of how to think about the world and how to think about that world with endless possibility, with feeling that, yes, I can take this piece of clay and I can make something and I can say this story in front of my peers and in front of my professor and, it can be accepted and shared and we can critique it. And I decided that I'm going to start from scratch and relearn how to think. And that's what RISD gave me. And that was the gift of RISD, the biggest gift you could ever imagine. Fast forward years later, um, the Syrian humanitarian crisis had started and Karam had existed. Karam means generosity in Arabic. And I decided that I wanted to spend a portion of my life serving others um, that are less fortunate. Um, the revolution changed everything and the crisis um, grew to one of the largest humanitarian crises of our lifetime. This week actually is the 10 year anniversary for the Syrian revolution and the beginning of the crisis. And our work really revolves around innovative education for refugee kids. It evolved over the past 10 years. But the portion that I want to tell you about today is that we have two centers in Turkey that serve Syrian refugees 
and um, specifically Syrian refugee families and teenagers. And in our centers, we actually deliver an innovative education program that is studio-based learning, design-based learning. These kids have access to maker spaces, computers, Wi-Fi, mentors. We hire actually Syrian refugee engineers and architects and designers to teach this curriculum. And, um, and they really have access to everything. And one of the most ma magical things about this specific program that happens at Kerem House is that it switches the whole idea of the elite education that's reserved for people who could afford to go to a place like RISD or afford to go to private schools where something like this would be available and makes it available for Syrian refugees um, and available for free. Um, we do this in coordination with our partner in Cambridge, Massachusetts, New View Studio and, and really adapted this curriculum. And But the essence of it is when I go there and I see the kids making their models and learning how to think, I know that we're giving them that essence of RISD, and I know that they're going to grow up not even knowing that they had that gap that I had even with all of my privilege and all of my education. And so um, I'm really grateful for RISD for teaching me that, and I'm trying to teach that to my kids as well. So really that is what we wanna talk about today is how do you take your RISD background, your RISD education and put it in service of your communities. And like Chris said, um, we're, we're inspired by our founder's story. We're in, inspired by the group of women who, um, who invested $1,600 for this university. And of course it's gonna be a group of women doing this and, and you know talk about return on investment on that and how much you can do with with that kind of you know, small um, amount of money, but a huge, huge impact and a huge, um, a huge um, will to change things. So RISD Serves is about bringing everybody together who's working in the social impact space and the um, nonprofit space, people who want to change the world for the better using their design backgrounds and taking all of the possibilities into consideration. So we are looking for other alumni to join us, to join the RISD Serves Committee. And so if you are interested in joining us, anybody here in the audience, anybody that you know, please email us at alumni at risd.edu or submit the update info form on our website to indicate your interest. And we'll all get together and hopefully have more events like this one, have more collaborations and hear about all the amazing work that you're doing in the world. Now I'm going to turn it over to our amazing panel. We have three amazing people here today. I'm so excited to have them. And we're going to have a discussion. Um, obviously, if you have any questions, please put it, I think we have a Q&A function. Uh, please put it in the Q&A function and we will be um, getting to them later in the talk, anything you'd like to ask these um, great humans. And I'm going to start with Stacy Asher. And Stacy is a creative leader in the nonprofit sector and has held positions at noted organizations such as the Child Mind Institute and Planned Parenthood. For more than a decade, she has channeled her passion and talent into designing for the purpose driven organizations and communities in need. An alumna of Rhode Island School of Design, Stacy is the founder and leader of the RISD Alumni Social Impact Affinity Group. So welcome, Stacy. Can you tell us a little bit about your work at the Child Mind Institute? Hi, Lena. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, I would be happy to. Um, if it's OK, I would love to give a little more background to share sort of my journey from RISD and to how I arrived at the Child Mind Institute. Um, my, you know, so. As Lena mentioned, I have worked over the last decade of my career as an in-house designer and art director at nonprofit organizations, um, but it wasn't always such a clear path for me. My first job out of school was in television, doing graphics for news, uh, and I realized pretty quickly that I uh, wasn't feeling very passionate uh, about the work that I was doing. It didn't serve a deeper purpose, and I wasn't really making a difference in anyone's lives and lives uh, with the work I was doing. So I started to seek out other areas of fulfillment. I was going to different meetups and lectures and learning about this idea called design activism. I uh, got involved with a program called Design for America, which I believe was started by a RISD alum. I volunteered at the Columbia Barnard chapter and mentored students there that were looking to use design to help tackle social challenges in their local communities. And all of this exploration really 
led me to the understanding that I wanted to pursue working in the nonprofit industry. Uh, I was very grateful to be able to make the professional transition to working for Planned Parenthood, which is a real game changer in my career. I um, was really introduced to mission-driven work and opened my eyes to my own privilege, which I was, I think, pretty blind to prior to, to starting this work. Um, the work I was focused on was about destigmatizing de reproductive health care and health care for women and providing accessible, affordable, quality health care to those that didn't have really any other options. And one project that I'm most proud to say that I worked on at my time at Planned Parenthood was the Democratic National Convention identity for the reelection of President Barack Obama in 2012. It was a hot pink signs and t-shirts and we did a riff on the Obama slogan. So we, our material said, yes, we plan with a big pill pack in the middle. And when I you know, looked at news coverage and images of the DNC that year, I saw all these flecks of hot pink and just felt the swell of pride knowing that that was my work that was being visible in that space. So from Planned Parenthood, I made the transition to the Child Mind Institute, which is a nonprofit that supports children and families struggling with mental health and learning disorders. And when I started at the Child Mind Institute, we were around 100 employees in one office. It was a startup like environment. And, you know, seven years later, we've more than doubled in size of our staff and we have four sites throughout the New York and California Bay Area. And at the Childman Institute, I've really had the opportunity to grow as a leader, um, in addition to just designing, really help the brand evolve to meet the needs of the organization and the audiences we are trying to reach. Um, the you know appetite for talking about mental health has really shifted over the last seven years since I started at the organization. And one campaign that I've worked on with my team that I think has really helped contribute to that change is, um, every May, which is Mental Health Awareness Month, we do a big public education campaign that uh, where we engage celebrities to share their experiences and challenges with mental health, um, be it they have a diagnosis or might be struggling with, you know, day to day issues. And especially in 2020, you know, a year where so many people all over the world were struggling with their mental health, we shifted the campaign the theme was we thrive inside. So we thrive inside our minds and we thrive inside our homes where we were all on lockdown. Um, and, you know, folks just shared their experiences of how, and, you know, of what it was like to be, you know, in quarantine and what it was like, how they took care of their mental health and the mental health of their families. And we received such a positive response from our audiences. Um, it felt like everyone needed to hear that message of hope and camaraderie. Uh, and we also met the moment by providing resources, which is the whole of what the organization does to uh, parents to um, help take care of their mental health or to their children or for their children to help take care of their mental health as well. And so looking back on this, you know, fulfilling career, I can see how the seeds were planted for this at RISD. Um, I didn't see it at the time, of course. <laughs> But looking back, I um, can see the different things I was involved in on campus really made a difference um, and really inspired me to, to follow this line of work. While I was a, a student, I did work study at Hasbro Children's Hospital and I did art projects with patients there. Um, I would work with you know, teens who were maybe outpatients or in the hospital for a day program. And I would also do, you know, bedside, I would go to children's bedsides and do art projects with them who might be in the hospital for more long-term chronic issues. And, you know, it gave everyone an outlet, a bit of joy, as we know, art can do for probably everyone that's participating here tonight. Um, so I just say that all with the perspective that when I first graduated, I didn't realize that I could have a career in design that would help people. And I needed to experience that and learn that firsthand uh, as I became a professional in the world. That's an amazing story and amazing journey, Stacey. I'm super inspired by it, especially about the mental health piece, because, you know, we, everybody um, 
really went through a lot in 2020, but we actually had to, um, you know, take this on as a challenge for when we're dealing with refugee youth. And it's something that you can say that everybody, like there, it's a huge issue. And, um, and we were kind of like not able to get involved with it, but then 2020 happens and the pandemic happens and then you have to do something. You can't just say it's too big, it's too hard. You have to do something to just jump in. So I really admire that you were already working on that and already were prepared for it. I wanted to ask you about the Social Impact Affinity Group. Um, can you tell us about why you started it and tell us more about that group? Yes, I'd be happy to, thank you. Um, so I started the RISD Alumni for Social Impact Affinity Group really because, you know, working in the nonprofit space, there um, aren't a ton of other, or at least I wasn't finding a ton of other communities specifically for designers that were working in that space. And so I thought that it would, could be a really powerful opportunity to um, engage RISD alum, engage students that are interested in doing that work and form a community. Um, and I would love to share that we have our kickoff event next week on March 23rd, where I'll be speaking with Sarah Obenauer, who's the founder of Make a Mark. Um, it's an organization that I've been personally involved with since 2018. And their, their deal is that they do 12 hour make a thons, which is bringing together designers and developers to help local nonprofits that are in need of these resources for design and digital work that otherwise might not have the budget or the access to that kind of uh, support. So if you're, uh, they have chapters all over the US in different cities and a few chapters internationally. So if you're interested in learning more about how you can get involved in your local community through design or to learn more about Make a Mark, I would definitely encourage you to join. And um, I believe information is being shared in the chat right now. So you guys can get involved with that. Awesome, thank you so much, Stacey. We're going to move now to John Sara Ruth and uh, invite her to speak about her work. I'll give you a short bio on her incredible work. John Sara is a designer, artist, educator, and agitator for Healthier Futures. She is co-founder and design director of Healthy Materials Lab at Parsons School of Design, where she is associate professor and founding director of the MFA Interior Design Program. As a designer, she has led creative and production teams to mass produce the healthiest and environmentally friendly children's furniture available in America. And she creates alluring and durable interiors using reuse strategies and biodegradable materials in her design studio, Salty Labs. Elevating everyday human experience is her underlying pursuit. Material curiosities drive her research. Jansara graduated from RISD in 1992 with a BFA in industri industrial design and later attended Cranbrook Cranbrook Academy of Art and received a master's in architecture in 1999. Welcome, John Sara. And I wanted to ask you about, similar to Stacy, what is your journey from designer to um, healthy materials lab? Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks for having me. You know, actually just listening to Stacy, I got all re-inspired about RISD, I have to say. And when you talked about Make a Mark, I just, it's so, such a great name and such a great organization. And then I thought, you know, when I was at RISD, I learned about mark making, <laughs> you know, that was a big thing. I think I didn't even know that that was a term that existed or something. So anyway, um, yeah, so I think, um, you know, I, I put, I shared that I graduated from industrial design and I, I think um, at RISD, you know, at Freshman Foundation, we had a conversation before this, this event about um, uh, the, the four of us and just about how we, loved Freshman Foundation and how that's a, a changing piece. And I think I came to RISD and I knew I loved to draw and I loved to make sculpture and I, I fell in love with glass. I kind of got addicted to glass, blowing and hot glass in every stage. And, um, and I learned wood and metal and ceramics and all these materials. Um, and I, I thought I might be an artist. I think my process is like an artist, but I, I knew that I wanted to give something to other people that would be helpful for other people to use, to make things. And then I learned about industrial design, which I, I didn't even know there was a profession until I was at, at RISD. But I, I wanted to make things that were useful to other people. And I really wanted them to be accessible. And I wanted to collaborate with other people. I didn't really like the idea of being like in my own studio all the time. Although now I treasure that. But at the time, I, I really wanted to you know, be engaged with people and give the world, contribute something to the world. And so I think that that's how I found design as a career versus art. Um, anyway, um, but I had the opportunity. So, you know, at, at that point, 
Um, I studied industrial design. It was a great education in materials. And now that's all coming back to me. You know, that understanding of how to make things with your hands, with the, you know, these different materials and understanding how those materials perform and understanding how you can manipulate them and how you can make form out of them. And then I, I spent a bunch of time also in the BEB because I was seeking, it was great to hear you talk about the BEB, Lena, because that's where the architecture program was. And that's kind of a lot of my friends were there and I had some professors who were there and I, I felt like that's where I found meaning in what I was doing. And so there was some kind of crossover between industrial design and architecture for me. Um, but I guess the question is, how did I get from being a designer till now? And I, you know, I, I always really wanted to, and I think even from RISD, I really wanted to design things for the general public. Like I wanted to offer really good design to everybody. I guess that's the Bauhausian idea and that's a kind of a foundation of RISD in general. Um, and I wanted it to be meaningful. And when I got, I had the opportunity actually after graduate school at, in architecture um, to design for the masses, to design furniture. I was kind of offered this position to like, will you start up a new furniture line to design for the mass production? And I got very excited about that. And um and began and I was traveling. So that was a, a big mass manufacturing line. And actually my employer was Martha Stewart who's hired lots and lots and lots of RISD people. I think that her organization, that organization is built on RISD knowledge. It's, it's pretty amazing. But um, I was in charge of furniture. And so I, I got to go to all the factories all over the world to find, you know, the, to, to approve the furniture that we had designed at our desks. And then somebody else was gonna make them in these big factories. And we were staying at this hotel and I got up really early one day to go for a run. It's probably like 6.30 in the morning or six o'clock. And I went to go for a run and the sky was green. I thought this is really weird. And then I started to run and I realized I couldn't breathe very well. And then I realized I had this whole kind of revelation. Like I had to go inside to breathe better. And then I realized that the factory that we were making our furniture in was contributing to the sky and to the green. And then I was mortified. I thought, oh my goodness, like it's one thing to do great design and give it to everybody, but it's another thing to, you know, to pollute the air that people breathe that are around these factories and that all the communities around this factory were suffering because of the things I was doing. And it was, it was mortifying and not to mention the people who are in the factory being exposed to all these materials every day. Um, so I had a complete a kind of rethinking about what I was doing. And, um, and I found myself shortly after that, um, I found a great company that was a real startup that was um, looking at making furniture for mass production, but in the healthiest way possible. And I, you know, I thought, sign me up. That's, that's what I, I'd like to do. And the company is called Q Collection. It was five people at the time, it grew to about 10 or 12 people. But the idea was to manufacture children's furniture that was the healthiest in the world. And at that point, I knew about environmental health. Like I knew about like the factory and like this was polluting the, work, the you know the, the environment, but I didn't really understand as much about how the materials that we work with were affecting the bodies of people and especially children. And so it was a huge learning experience for me. It was a lot of research based, but what I learned through the process of you know producing Q Collection Junior, which was this line of children's furniture that was the healthiest on the market was that, um, you know, that we had to use materials and finishes that did not affect people negatively. And that was a huge learning experience. We worked with toxicologists and, and, um, and as well as manufacturers and you know, people who were in um, science and um, policy and regulators and you know, a whole group of people that I had never worked with. And you know, it was it's really cross disciplinary to figure out that there's a link between the things our world is made of and our our health. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's the kind of a chronological story. But fast forward to now, this is what we do at Healthy Materials Lab, which is understand that that link between our health and the, the things around us is huge. And actually, that there's there's something called the Exposome Project which is um, engaged by Mount Sinai and many other institutions, which is um, a, a project that, that is revealing, a scientific project that's revealing that um, our disease or human disease is only 10% is related to genetics and that the other 90% is related to our exposure over our lifetime 
to the environments that we're in or to the things that we're around. Or, and so um, with that big awareness, it's just, it, it feels like, why wouldn't we try to make everybody aware of this who's working in the discipline of architecture or design or anything that we make or, or art? Um, and so we had my partner, Alison Mears, and I, who are colleagues at, at Parsons, and she was directing the undergraduate interiors and architecture program at Parsons. And I was asked to come direct the MFA program, MFA interior design program at Parsons. Um, we were given this opportunity to start an, a lab at Parsons called the Healthy Materials Lab. Um, the opportunity was given to us because of a receipt of a, a large grant from the JPB Foundation which was funding a partnership. And the partnership is called the Healthy Affordable Materials Project. And there's four um, partners on that. There's the Green Science Policy Institute, the Health Product Declaration Collaborative, and the Healthy Building Network. And some are scientists, some are policy advocates, and some are kind of researchers coming together to say, actually, this needs healthy materials need to be available to everybody and need to be affordable. And we need to target actually the, um, the affordable housing community. And that's who needs it most because they are most exposed to toxics in the environment. So we have a joint commitment to reduce the toxic chemical exposure in the US building industry through manufacturing and through use to it and to build the capacity of an affordable housing sector to achieve that widespread use of materials and ultimately to advance healthier lives for all people and especially for vulnerable communities. So uh, that, that's a, a bit about me. And, you know, I have to say that I'm still a designer at heart and I'm, I'm still an artist and I still practice um, at the same time as running this, this program. So the creative piece doesn't leave, but I guess I would agree that, you know, RISD really gave that permission sheet to think differently than you, than you might've thought before and to think broadly and bring that kind of thinking to anything that you do. And so even though what we're doing at Healthy Materials Lab isn't specifically designing something, we're really advocating for others. There's a lot of creativity in thinking about how we do that. Um, yeah. Absolutely, that's amazing. I totally agree with that. And I see that also um, in just the way that you, you, you just bring that creativity to everything you do without even, you, it's just there and it's your tool. Um, that you have to make you think about things differently and thank God for that because that's the only way I think that change happens in these kinds of industries and um, in corporations and all of that. So incredible, incredible work. Um, I'm going to move on to Max and uh, Dr. Max Frieder. And um, I know Max from working together with him um, on, a, on a project that he did um, with Kerem uh, back in 2013 at a 2013? Yeah, it was 2013 um, in Southern Turkey in Rayhande, which I hope we'll talk about. But first to give you um, some information about Max, um, Dr. Max Frieder is a community-based community public artist and educator who is the executive director and co-founder of Artolution. Artolution focuses on educating local teaching artists in refugee camps, conflict zones, and traumatized communities how to cultivate locally led public art and education programs with children and families, and currently has over 80 local teaching artists in the Rohingya refugee camps in Bangladesh, the South Sudanese refugee settlements in Uganda, the Syrian refugee camps in Jordan, and with the displaced Venezuelan refugees and internally displaced people in Colombia and across the United States. Artolution's mission is to strengthen communities in crisis through the power of art and to build a world where art connects, supports, and transforms communities. He published a three-year body of research through his art education doctorate at Teachers College, Columbia University, titled The, Ro the Rohingya Artolution, teaching locally-led community-based public art educators in the largest refugee camp in history. Max graduated with a BFA painting from RISD in 2012. So welcome, Max, and so happy Happy to see you again, and I'm so excited that you're on this panel. I wanted to ask you about how you decided to start Artolution, and also I want to ask you, I mean, I've seen firsthand how your work has affected refugee communities, so I want you to give us a, a taste of, um, you know, one of the memorable or powerful experiences that you have seen your art um, actually impact um, the communities that you've worked with. 
Amazing. Um, so first, I'm so thrilled to be on this panel. And if you just hear what Jun Sara and Stacy said, what an honor to be speaking with both of you. And Lena is just an incredible colleague. And when I saw that you were on this, I, I literally exploded that I was so excited um, because we haven't we haven't uh, talked for a long time and I'm just so thrilled. Um, so so let me give a little bit of background. I can actually directly say that Art Illusion started at RISD. Um, when I was, I was lucky enough to get to do a study abroad program um, where I was uh, studying abroad in New Zealand, working with Modi communities, with the indigenous communities there, working with kids who'd been incarcerated. And I kind of started to see that when you got communities together and you had children come together to tell their stories, that something transcendent happened, like something profound was happening. And, and, and I realized, okay, this is, this is something special. This is like a solution. This is an evolution. This is kind of a revolution. Maybe it's an art illusion. And this word, like the genesis of this word came when I was studying abroad um, at RISD. And what was amazing is when I was there, I was lucky enough that when I was at RISD, I got very encouraged to do some pretty remarkable programs working with the RISD Museum, being able to work with the Providence Children's Museum, um, being able to work with City Arts in Providence, um, and actually getting to do a winter session course that I created for myself in an in independent study working throughout Latin America, um, being able to work throughout Costa Rica, uh, painting murals as well. And what I saw was, wow, if we take this, this amazing opportunity that we have as RISD students, and, and these seeds that we all get this opportunity how can we plant those seeds for others who may not have that opportunity? Whether that be in South Providence and kids who may be in a very different world, even if they're very geographically close or on the other side of the world. And I was lucky enough that coming out of RISD, I already had an international portfolio of work that I'd already done. So being able to discuss work in, in other parts of the world was a very fluid transition, right? It was a very, um, it, it was a very organic, I'd say, type of a growth and it really came from RISD. And the one thing that RISD gave me that I think is, is really important probably for all of us, I'd imagine, was the ability to work ridiculously hard, ridiculously hard. And, and that, that sensation of, of having more to do than you ever feel like you could ever get done, um, that is the RISD ethos, pathos, and logos, right? And I think for anyone who's been there, you know that. And if you're in the non-for-profit sector or if you're in the social impact se sector, it's really hard. It's not easy, right? It's really hard work. And I feel like I learned that from my time at RISD, from my foundation year of staying up for three days straight, trying to get done my you know, 2D or 3D design final. Um, and, and, and just to go kind of to the beginning. So that was my beginnings was, was starting to do this work. But then all of a sudden I realized that when we would leave, the number one question, these incredible, talented, dedicated artists who already have this amazing talent, the number one question that they would ask is, when are you coming back? And that's the wrong question, right? The right question is how do we do this for ourselves, right? How do we create a locally led sustainable model where you have these artists being able to be supported to do it for their own communities, right? And what does that mean? And what does it take to do that? And one of the things I realized is this education I received at RISD, it's, it's so rare that people get to have that, that opportunity. And in many parts of the world, basic literacy, running water, you know, doesn't exist. And yet the idea that, that an education like RISD has value, I started, we, me and then uh, my co-founder, Joel Bergner, we started working together thinking, okay, how can we make this sustainable? So what we started to do is to say, okay, we need to find these people and we need to train them how to be able to implement these programs of community-based public art education initiatives. And then those programs need to be self-sustaining. Right, and so what we started to do is, um, is we started to build these teams. So we actually scaled it from being just the two of us, kind of nomadic artists doing this around the world, to actually saying, okay, we need to make this something that actually has a long-term impact in these communities. And so that's what happened. Um, so we started working in these different in these different environments, and we and we started to train teams. Now there were a couple of really important components. One, what if nobody has someone has no experience in the arts, right? And what we found is even if somebody may have never been allowed to go to school or may have had a lot of uh, problems with access to literacy or basic education they still had the abilities to be able to care and to want to change their own communities. So one of the things that we started to do is we actually developed a training manual. And this training manual really went through the processes, both pedagogically with this fancy word, right? But how do you teach about the ability to make people care and also to, to facilitate civic dialogue. And then for that to turn into actually public arts pro, uh, uh, programs. And so we, look, thinking about the four regions that Lena touched on, you know, we work a lot in the largest refugee camp in history, which is the Rohingya refugee crisis in Bangladesh on the border of Myanmar um, during the, 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 the genocide and the influx that happened in 2017. When this happened, um, we, I, 
I, I was lucky enough to, st to start to go there and we started to train these teams. And people said, well, I don't really know if I'm an artist because I wasn't really allowed to make art when I was in Myanmar, or at least call myself an artist. But I always loved art. It was always something that I loved so much in my life, right? And what we found was that even though people really didn't define themselves as artists, they had amazing creative inclinations. And so that team started with just with Muhammad Noor and Muhammad Hassan. And then it ended up growing to now we have over 20 artists ar uh, around the camp who are leading their own programs year round. Um, a similar type of story happened within the Syrian camps with the work we were doing in Azraq refugee camp on the border of Syria, um, which uh, in many ways grew out of my work with Lena and the incredible inspiration I had from working with Karam many years ago. Um, and then as well as working largely in the largest refugee settlement in Africa, which is in Uganda on the border of South Sudan, which is called the Bidi Bidi refugee settlement. And there, you know, we're working a lot with host communities and refugees where there's so many different kinds of internal conflicts. And, um, and, and what we found is whether it be in the Venezuelan crisis in Colombia, whether it be across any of the regions that we work with, including the United States, how can we create cohesion? How can we make people care and be humanized? And the way to do that is by people telling their own stories, right? Being able to have people facilitate their own communities to tell their stories. And so in order to really pay homage to that, and in order to actually do that, I think we need to use the, the, the words of folks who maybe aren't on this phone call, right? So I wanted to, I wanted to tell the story of one woman named Dildar. Dildar is one of the most inspiring women I've ever met in my entire life. And rather than me telling her story, I actually wanted to use a quote um, and actually directly quote her uh, from my dissertation. I did about three years of, uh, of direct research, collecting hundreds of pages of interviews and focus groups and testimonials from the Rohingya camps and really getting people to tell their own stories. Of what does it take to make a sustainable model of local artists creating their own change? So I just wanted to take 30 seconds, if you don't mind, and read this, th this excerpt um, from Dildar, uh, who's from Myanmar, from Rakhine State, and fled, uh, fled the crisis there into, into Bangladesh. Um, and also just to give you a scale, an understanding, uh, when she wrote this, um, and when she told us this, this was directly after she had what we call shock-based mutism, where she actually didn't speak for nine months um, because of the trauma that she faced of losing her family members. And you can see the transformation. So I'm just gonna read this very quickly. Okay, thank you. When we were in Myanmar, we were in jail. We were detained. We just lived as detained people and we lost our family members and our husbands and fathers were killed. There's a horrible situation inside of Myanmar. When I arrived in Bangladesh, I couldn't even speak and I was traumatized and I wasn't able to speak to the people because I didn't feel anything that I was alive. People would ask to me questions and share many things and I was just quiet and I feel that they have the same situation. When I work and engage with Art Illusion for the first time, I started to speak. I felt that I got my life back and I was reborn and I try to speak and I continue to speak. And this is not only me. There are around the refugee camp, there are thousands of women like me. When I visit the camp and work with different people in the different camps, I help them to speak and thousands of people are like them. I want so that I can help all of the people, those who do not have a voice, they can raise their voices and they can say whatever they want. This is what I want to keep continuing every single day. Dildar, 2018. Um, amazing that's amazing max and a beautiful beautiful story and i um you know max and his team came and they made this huge mural on this refugee school that we were working with in southern turkey and Rayhanle. and it was you know it wasn't really a school it was a makeshift school um and it should have housed maybe a, a couple hundred kids it had over 1200 kids in it and they made this huge mural of a girl, the profile of a girl. And I remember Max, we, we, we had to get scaffolding and all the kids were up on the scaffolding and they're actually using their hand prints to create this like landscape and cityscape. And it was really, really, really inspiring. But Max, you should know that at Ketterm House, we've done several mural studios and, um, and we taught the kids how to make murals and they have to actually design their mur murals from an idea. And the first wall we were given in the town, which is a Turkish town, um, and there's a lot of hostility towards refugees. And, um, and one of the, the one small school um, that was off, off like a side street and nobody would really see this wall. They created this mural for the school and they executed it. And it got so popular that the mayor of Rehande, the Turkish mayor actually asked the kids at Kerem House to design a huge mural to talk about um, keeping the streets clean on the main street. And so it was about that whole idea is that how you empower them with the skill, they know how to create the skill, but now they're no longer refugees. They're people that the mayor 
will come to to say, we need this in our city. This is our city, both refugees and host community together. Can you create this? And that's like a really big power of murals and art and, um, and community. Totally. And, and, and I will say, you know, what you just said, Lena, I mean, it's this, it's this transformation of, be, of going from being really a, a, a victim or a survivor to becoming an agent of social change. And that shift, which I think is so important, it comes right back down to RISD and being able to provide something like a RISD education for these teams of artists or the kids you're working with in Rahanla is so invaluable. And I know uh, if, if, if I could finish on one note, when I was at RISD, I was lucky enough to create something called the uh, Foundstrument Soundstrument Project, um, where I built an interactive school sculpture out of trash and recycled materials. And it was a and it was a playable musical sculpture. And this concept, which I ended up displaying at the Providence Children's Museum, now we actually have our artists around the world who are teaching about sustainability, the environment, and about really ways of being able to, to upcycle and being able to have kids do it for their own communities. And this idea came from when I was in the Prov Wash building, you know, it, it, it came from my time at RISD. And it was something that's been, um, I'd say, hugely inspiring. And the correlation to me is so direct, um, just like Stacy and Jansara were saying. Um, I think RISD was the foundation maybe for all of us of where we've gone. So it's, it's amazing to be here talking with all of you. Thank you, Max. So please um, enter your questions in the Q&A. We're going to open it up to the audience in a few minutes. I know that there are a couple of questions there already. I want to go back to Stacy, and I want to ask you about what advice that you would give to RISD students or recent graduates who want to jump into this field of work, working in the nonprofit or social impact sector. Um, do you think that being a founder is important and if you were to get involved in an organization, what would be your advice to how to choose the right organization for somebody who wants to jump in? Uh, thank you, Lena, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think it's really important to do your homework and do your research. Um, you know, even on social media, just following the organizations that really inspire you and the causes that you feel really connected to, um, you know, if you're looking to work directly with them, as I have in my career, learning um, what their in-house teams might look like, what um, you know resources they have available. A lot of times, uh, starting as a volunteer can really help for you know organizations that might not have the the means to hire designers. Um, you know, for example, over the summer or the spring. Um, my the local Black Lives Matter chapter in my community was posting a lot of events trying to get people together for rallies and I personally couldn't participate in those because I was living with immunocompromised people in the middle of a pandemic but I reached out to them and said hey can I, I'm a designer can I help make some stuff for you guys um, so I think getting involved in the community is really helpful or getting involved in organizations that you really inspire you or that you um, you know just want to become a part of our really great start and you know getting involved in other communities like the RISD alumni affinity group for social impact um finding other people who out there who are doing the work that you want to be doing and trying to open doors and and start conversations thank you stacy i wanted to ask john sara about the healthy materials lab and go back to that could you tell us a little bit about, you know, where where is the future of this work? It's and um, where what would we see coming out of the lab? Let's say five, ten years from now, where where is this work going towards? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, thanks for that question. I mean, I think you know, the ultimate goal is for us not to have to exist. You know, for all materials to be healthy, and we won't need to advocate for that. That's the ultimate goal, but. What, uh, what, a, what we're learning now, we're six years in, and what we're learning is it's a steep, it's a steep climb. Um, so I think, you know, uh, it's a steep climb, I, th I think, to say that regulation, the government regulation is lack lagging in the United States, that there isn't a lot of regulation around chemical production, or, you know, there isn't the kind of nutrition label of materials that there is for food. Um, there are a lot of Policy, you know, there's a lot of lobbyists um, going to Washington and trying to change that and change regulation. But in the meantime, we as designers and makers and architects, we need to become aware ourselves. And, and so what, what I can say for the next five years, maybe what we're seeing is that um, just by building awareness campaigns and communicating about this, and we've created an education platform, an online education platform where architects and designers can learn about this. We've seen 
like a, an exponential growth in people who are, and it's not just us doing this work there. Like I said, there are other organizations, but just, just since we've started, we've seen exponential growth in people being aware and really wanting to change what they're using. And that's really encouraging. It's, it's really encouraging. You know, I think what we, what we need to do is, is to, um, to achieve our goal is to really make sure that any kind of housing, especially housing that's built for vulnerable populations who don't have control over their own environments, um, are getting housing that's built with healthier materials. Because, you know, you and I, we might have the choice about which kind of cleaning product we're going to bring into our home, or even what kind of sofa we might buy, or, you know, we have that kind of privilege to choose what we eat or what we bring into our houses for our families and, and for ourselves. And that's not the case for so many people. They don't have the same choice. And so, you know, hopefully, you know, the, the goal in the next five years is to say, actually, the people making the choices for other people are going to make healthier choices. And, um, and we're, we're making some progress on that. You know, I think, um, yeah, that's a, that's a, a snippet of an answer. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Jansara. And I have a question for Max, um, which is, and I mean, these questions could have been for all three, but I'm trying to separate them out just because of time. And we'll move to the Q&A after this. But the question for Max, because I do think that your work probably got the most affected, I'm assuming, by COVID in 2020 with all of the travel and um, working in refugee camps and um, how, do, how the camps actually have even coped with the pandemic. So could you talk to us a little bit about how um, you uh, coped through COVID and if there are any lessons learned from the pandemic and working through the pandemic that you'll take forward afterwards? Yeah, I mean, I think it's affected every sector, right, in every way that any of us could imagine. You know, for us, we're at a very intersectoral process in which we're working in the public health sector, we're working in mental health and wash sanitation and hygiene and child protection. You know, we're working in many of the different humanitarian sectors, and they've all been hit, right, by, by COVID. And so, you know, my first answer is that, you know, it's all about relationships. And what we found is that when, if you can imagine, right, if this is an organization and it's really bending as hard as you can imagine, it's the relationships that have Held things together. And so when I say that, we have these teams, right? We have about 80 artists around the world and they are still artists and they still really care. And luckily we had finished our series of training, some of them four, five, six, seven phases of training um, where they already knew this process. They were able to teach others in their own community. So when a massive crisis like this hits, we had the capacity to really adapt our strategies ranging from some really interesting programs of, for example, creating a series of illustrations for caregivers who were illiterate to be able to learn how to have learning through play and early childhood development within their homes. Being able to, for example, in Uganda, we had our teams be able to create um, stop motion animations using mud that was turned into clay to create figurines to be able to create stories about public health. Uh, we had some of our folkloric musicians recording songs about the importance of wearing a mask and social distancing, um, as well as ranging from a whole series of digital programs. We launched something uh, right at the beginning called uh, our Virtual Bridges program, where we were able to have different refugee youth being able to meet each other and make art together um, through Zoom, as well as continuously doing professional development and training. And, you know, what's been really kind of fascinating is in, especially during a time of crisis like this, and I loved what Stacy was saying, mental health is so important, especially in places that are already stigmatized and isolated. And so what we found is that rather than the arts being like a cheap add-on, the arts need to be at the forefront of a crisis response. And it needs to be something that's, that's coinciding with the mental health and psychosocial support strategies. It needs to correspond with the educational strategies and with the ways of creating social cohesion when there's so much tenseness that's happening every day. And people need a way to let that out. And if you don't let it out in healthy ways, then it'll come out in unhealthy ways. And I say that because what we found is that people have gotten really innovative. Like our teams have gotten super innovative on painting murals on quarantine facilities, for example, or being able to create drawings with children, <coughs> excuse me, that have been able to be made into books. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, so to answer your question, it's been a very challenging time. I think in all non-for-profit sectors, it's been very difficult, especially for the funding part, which none of us like to talk that much about, but it's the reality. It's been a very challenging time for funding. Um, but at the same time, the need is even more than it's ever been before. 
So it's this interesting of need versus um, what, what's there. But I would definitely say that I think a lot of these skills, again, that resilience, I, I think in many ways came from RISD. And I just want to give a call out to Mike Fink, who taught me a lot about that. Um, he's an old time mentor and professor of mine at RISD who talked a lot about resilience. And, um, and it's come into more, more effect in my life than I ever thought it would. So um, I, I hope that answers your question, but I could definitely talk more on it. Thank you, Max. John Sarah and Stacy, do you have anything to add th on this on difficulties or challenges during the pandemic or because of COVID um, or lessons learned moving forward, um, taking it forward from the pandemic? I could speak to that. Stacy, do you have, do you want to jump in? By all means, go ahead. I mean, one of the things that has become really clear with COVID is, you know, we're learning more and more about the disease. And what we know is that people with underlying conditions are the most affected. And so, and we're also seeing that those who are heaviest hit are those with, that are in majority black, brown or indigenous communities, at least in the United States. And that that's not a coincidence. So if we think about again, that an underlying condition has to do with the environment that you're in, it's just, it's so that people who live near factories or near highways or polluted waters or waste dumps or treatment facilities have increased rate of diseases like, you know, chronic diseases like asthma and diabetes and obesity, different kinds of cancers because of that polluted environment that they are living in and because of the interior environments that they're living in, which are also polluting their homes and their bodies, which gives them this underlying condition, which then makes them more susceptible to to dying or, or having severe symptoms from COVID. And so I think that that, that, core, that connection is, is not new to our work, but I think that that's become elevated and, and brought to be more aware in the general public now than it was before. And so it's a horrible thing, but in some ways I'm grateful that that's become much more clear so that it's, um, you know, an underlying condition can be the place you're living in. <laughs> And, and, that's, um, and that's the work that we're doing. And so to, to try to change that. And so, you know, and I think, so that's the, that's the tough part that, but also um, the awareness piece has become easier. The storytelling has become easier for us in that way. Really horrible. The other side of it, I think that has become um, a lesson of COVID is that, you know, we, we shifted so quickly and talk about resilience and might think like we shifted so quickly I think just a year ago, right? Didn't we just pass this anniversary from being in person and doing everything in, you know, in person, teaching and learning online and doing our work online and being together to this, to being in little boxes and doing all our work through these little boxes. It's happened so fast that people are like, you know, here we are, we're experts in Zoom and we, we know how to do things differently in just a year. And so in, to me, that gives me great hope of the human species actually, that we are resilient. And I, I, you know, again, like this is my experience, like, wow, we can pivot fast, but you know, I, I have so much respect for you who work with, you know, working with refugees who must have to experience that in the hardest way possible, where you, you have to pivot your whole, you know, worldview has to shift and you have to continue to live in a new way. But I think, you know, if our behaviors can change, so quickly, then couldn't they change around, you know, the consumption of fossil fuels or the consumption of toxic material production, or, you know, these things can change where it felt like more of an impossible task, maybe two years ago than it does now. Thank you so much, John Sara. Just quickly before Stacy chimes in on this, I just wanted to say whenever I do these Zoom uh, calls or panels and they're around the evening time, I always think to myself, oh, if this was normal time, I would have to be on a plane and be somewhere doing this in person. And now I can just go home and have dinner. But today I'd much rather be in Providence. <laughs> So hopefully that will happen. But a lot of times I'm like, I'm so glad that I'm not in X place and having to be away for a few days. So like that's also like a silver lining of the pandemic of getting to do the, a lot of these events and not having to have all of the, you know, expense and the time and the resources it takes to get people into one room. Stacey, I mean, mental health, you spoke about it before, but I think it's a huge, a huge issue that came up in the pandemic. How did, um, how did it affect your work and, um, and how, what did you take forward? Or what will you be taking forward? 
Um, thank you. And I think a lot of what I have to say is reflective of what John Sara just shared. Um, first, in terms of our ability to evolve um, with the work that we do and how we do it, um, you know, it's kind of amazing to see how um, organizations can really sustain themselves even in an entirely remote world. Um, you know, the the workforce sort of in general, I think, you know, will never go back to the way it was before in terms of people, you know, as you just said, Lena, having that flexibility to, you know, have dinner with their family and still do all these things that they're really passionate about. And I'm sure, you know, all the folks here today are experiencing that to some extent. Um, and as you, you speak about mental health, I mean, that's exactly it. You know, it's this been this underlying condition that so many people um, struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis in our society um, you know especially it, you know it for so many it starts in childhood which is what my organization specifically focuses on um, and i think that the pandemic really you know brought it to the fore and allowed us all to talk really openly about how we all were coping or not coping um, and sort of the the wave of you know, anxiety that is going to continue to ripple through society even after the pandemic is over and more people are getting vaccinated, but just sort of reacclimating to what normal life will look like um, and how we'll keep ourselves safe um, and how we'll keep ourselves healthy, um, you know, with John Sarah's work physically and, you know, with the work of the Child Mind Institute in our, in our minds. Thank you, Stacey. We have a question for the entire panel. I know we just have um, about 15 more minutes before we close, so we want to keep the, the answers a little bit shorter. And please, anybody in the audience wanting to ask more questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A. So we have a question from O'Neill that is, um, in each of your stories, you are actively working on aspects of public policy. How can RISD prepare its students to work more effectively in impacting public policy in the US and globally? So um, we want to start with, um, let's start with you, Stacey, and come back around. Sure. So I think that, you know, at least from what I've been learning about, um, you know, Lena and Jansara and Max is their work really um, takes into account the global and big picture side of this, which I find incredibly inspiring. And I think the other side of the coin is, you know, thinking about your local community and similar to the answer that I gave to you earlier, Lena, is thinking about, you know, how you can get involved in your local communities, know your representatives, know the different organizations that are aligned with your values, and um, think about how you can support them, not just a, as a designer, but as a creative problem solver and um, what you have to lend to those communities um, and becoming involved and staying committed to that work. John Sarah, I'm going to you and also adding on the layer that you've got another question that's a little bit connected, which is about how government policies and regulations protect us from toxic materials and what international governing body exists to oversee the production of toxic materials. So if you could do both of those questions, please. Yeah, so um, unfortunately, government policies and policy change works very slowly. And even though there's now awareness about these links between human health disease, chronic disease, even, uh, even pretty severe disease and the materials that we're, we're working with or the, the chemical additives, there is not change, the change isn't fast enough. There's like, you know, 100,000 chemicals out there and there's not really regulation in place. And so the big chemical companies are allowed to just produce something um, without having it tested first for the effects on human health. And so that policy change, what I've found is very, very frustrating. If we were to wait for policy change, we would not make any change at all. Um, it's, it's not happening quickly. I mean, there are some chemicals of concern that have been put on lists and you know some of them like asbestos and lead. Um, some of these, you know, some of these, you know, there's now PFAS chemicals. Maybe somebody saw dark waters, um, which was put out maybe two years ago. It's a you know Hollywood blockbuster film about the the cattle and the people who were affected by some spills into the into a river in southern Ohio who were producing these you know PFOS these kind of stain repellents and water repellent chemicals the ones that are used like in Teflon pans it got into the environment and all these 
cattle and people got sick and um he's a filmmaker i mean that was done as a there was a big new york times article and then there was a film made and i have to say so thinking about at RISD and what we can do. I think as creative people, we can do things in, in ways that are not just policy. Um, you know, it's a creative, yeah, I think, Lena, what you said in the very beginning about like having to, RISD asks you to rethink everything you knew prior and turn it upside down and be challenged to question everything you knew before. And that is very scary as a student at RISD. Like you think you've, you've arrived and you know something and then you realize, oh, they're asking me to say like, I don't know anything and remake it. And I think that ability to be, you know, humble, humbled and have to reinvent and recreate and think every question through the other side of, you know, through a lens you've never looked through before. I think that gives people an ability to rethink the way we do everything. And so I, I guess I'm saying that because I'm not sure that like, focusing directly on policy is, and focusing kind of curriculum on policy is the right way. I think actually the RISD way is more about getting people to understand how to rethink things. So I, I guess this is a longer answer than you wanted, but the, um, there isn't enough policy at the moment and these big films and uh, camp, you know, communications campaigns. I've learned a lot from my colleague at RISD who is Sarah Durham, who has a big duck um, NYC, really communications for nonprofits. She's been a super guide for us at Healthy Materials Lab about how we build a brand, build awareness, build campaigns around, around, about awareness and actually create a kind of escalating awareness campaigns that really work. And it's through social media and it's through, you know, the design of, you know, images, it's through the design of language, it's through design of communications. And that's maybe even it's proving to be more powerful and quicker. I should just say it's quicker than the, than my colleagues who are in Washington trying to make policy change. Um, yeah, I'm sure Thank there's a lot more to say. Power. That was really, really great. Max, I know that your work has, it's international, it's in the most vulnerable communities, the most marginalized communities in the world. How can RISD prepare its students to work more effectively in impacting public policy in the U.S. and globally? I know it affects your work. Every day, um, every day. And so here, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach than what Jansara and Stacy said, who I deeply agree with what both of them said. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my immediate response is thinking, how do we change the standard of practice in a field? Right. So when I think about policy, I don't necessarily think about public policy in the U.S. government. I think about policy about the way the United Nations functions or the way that the European Union allocates funding or the State Department or USAID. Um, for us, we work a lot with these large institutions like UNICEF, UNHCR, the Red Cross, International Rescue Committee, uh, Plan International, these very large institutions. And what we've really found is that to get them to change their policies about how they allocate and redistribute wealth and redistribute resources, that you have to make very compelling arguments arguments, how something like the arts can actually help them achieve their pre-existing mission and vision. And what we found is that you have to have a very intersectoral approach. So an example, we were working with the German Development Agency called GIZ, and we did a program. I was actually working with my girlfriend, who is a RISD alumni for in the apparel department, and she was helping to teach about costume making and sewing and how to be able to make outfits, and which is a real skill that we taught to a group of Syrian girls in Lebanon in a place called the Qad. And we also worked with my partner, Joel, and his wife, C who actually put on a whole performance based on poetry um, about what it was like leaving Syria. And then we created a large sound instrument, sound instrument and a mural. Now, this was the first time that the German Development Agency had ever funded something like this. But the reason they wanted to fund it was because it made a compelling argument that being able to bring together Syrian, Palestinian, and Lebanese girls together to be able to come up with their story was actually achieving a pre-existing mission of social cohesion, of being able to bring these folks together in ways where, where the arts are actually one of the most powerful ways to do that. I say this because I think when we're trying to shift policy, we need to shift the way that I, I believe that resources are spent. And the way and being able to embrace things like arts, design, art education, you, you have to figure out very clever ways to use their language. Right. So you have to use terms like psychosocial support, social and emotional learning. You know, you have to figure out creative ways that it ticks off their boxes 
and how they need to allocate, you know, their large grant that came from ECHO, right, or that came from any large humanitarian organization. So what we found is, is most of the time the arts are never considered. Like it's not even something that's, that, that, that's in the forefront, or if it is, it's art therapy with a clinician and a patient. And what we're saying is that, is that actually art as education, as a catalyst for community dialogue, that needs to be a funding priority. Like it needs to be a way that, that resources are reallocated. So when we, when we think about policy, I think about it in the way that, um, that priorities are set, number one. And number two, how do we as designers and artists make compelling arguments using their language to actually communicate that initial curiosity and that seed that came from RISD, which is exploration, cultivation, these really important ideas. But sometimes I think we need to learn the language of others. And if we're actually students at RISD is to, is to understand that in order to sometimes make your uh, discipline flourish, you need to work with other disciplines and you need to know how they function and how these different structures can build off each other and that we all need to be bridge builders. Um, that would be my answer. Thank you so much, Max. I mean, I can add on here is that I do believe that language is very, very important. Um, I would say that um, look, after, you know, a decade of working on Syria and um, seeing a lot of organizations and large agencies and seeing these huge grant applications, um, and it's often very, very inaccessible for organizations like Keram that are very small and also kind of working outside the box, but you actually do see a lot of, oh, if it's called psychosocial, then it'll have X amount, or if it's called, you know, whatever it is, but a lot of times um, the work that we do is doing this kind of psychosocial support, uh, doing this like community building, all of these things. And I would say that I think that RISD students, if they knew that their work had that um, possibility of impact um, in a way that we're not isolated, that and that you actually, even beyond that, you have that responsibility to make a change in the world, to have your work grounded in, 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 in real change. And, and you can choose what you want to like, you know, where you want to make that change. I mean, this panel is a very diverse panel in terms of the spaces that we work, but what connects it is deciding that, you know, I have these kinds of skills, I have this vision and I can make a change in the world where I think um, it's necessary and I can make an impact. And I think that if more students understood that these degrees and this these fields have that, um, have that huge sense of uh, like impact and possibility, I think it would be really great. And, um, and I think that it's, it would be really important because the language of art and the language of communication and design does like Stacy brought this up, camp these kinds of campaigns, you know, multiply and scale up so quickly. And, uh, and I think that that's really a big power uh, that we have um, that other, you know, if you go into an organization that has no creatives in it, we all know what happens there. <laughs> so um, I wanted to wrap up. I think we are done with our, oh, actually there's one question for John Sar really quickly. And then just one last question before we wrap. Um, you have a question from Sarah Durham and actually this panel was her inspiration. So shout out to Sarah. Um, how do you work with the students at Parsons to engage them with healthy materials and socially conscious design work? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's really about teaching them the issue to, to start with, with talking about the issue and raise awareness that this is even an issue at all. Um, and then inspiring, you know, students to say, you know, there are many ways to work with healthier materials that can be just as inspiring, that, that it's not a, it's not programmatic. There's a lot of place for, in, you know, new invention and some of the students are actually inventing new materials, which is super exciting. You know, maybe it's not usable at the moment, but there's people who are in the, Parsons is part of the new school university. And so we have a science lab where folks can experiment. And so there's, there's experimentation with, you know, algae and kelp and uh, oyster shells and, you know, all kinds of things to think about, like, how do we make materials out of biological materials rather and biodegradable materials rather than you know synthetic so that's one thing but I, you know it always starts with just making people aware of the issue and i you know i think design students more than anybody get it really quickly like as soon as you tie health to the materials we're working with they go like okay well tell me what the alternative is because i'm i'm on mm -hmm. so you know i think that the issue really speaks for itself in many ways i would also just say um, to, I was just thinking about the, the prior question, and this has to do with the students too, but um, a lot can happen with collaboration. You know, I, I find that in, in my work, like, you know, 
I am, you know, I am schooled in the creative arts and the creative thinking and design and art and architecture. And I, you know, there's, I'm not a policymaker, but I can work with policymakers and I can work with doctors and scientists. And we, we've had some incredible, you know, I don't know, I have had incredible conversations with concrete manufacturers, for instance, that are so inspiring and feel like, oh, you know, together we can change the world. And so, you know, I think that collaboration is a big piece that we can teach in at RISD or at Parsons or wherever we're teaching to say, you know, cross, get out of, you know, it's not just collaborating with, you know, within the creative disciplines, but outside of our disciplines entirely. And so I think that collaboration can be, can be nurtured. And, and that's a place I think RISD could improve. I think that is something in, in my education, but, you know, I was eons ago, so maybe, maybe that's already happening. But, uh, Definitely. There's always room for improvement, for better collaboration. Thank you so much, John Sara. So before we wrap up, I think um, there are some uh, notes in the chat that Sarah Durham is actually speaking on a panel next week on March 22nd, and there's a registration link in the chat. I want to ask all, for our panelists one question. You can answer with one word or a sentence. Um, service is blank. What is service to you? Max, you want to go? Sure. Um, I would say service is profound wonder. Um, and if you're wondering what that might mean, I just have to make a quick announcement. Um, after a year of working this upcoming Friday uh, morning, um, we're going to have a feature article in the New York Times about our illusion. Um, and so if anybody's interested, please check it out. And that'll give you an idea of what the profound wonder is that I'm talking about. Um, Wonderful. So we'll look out for it. Stacy. Um, I think that service is giving in whatever way, shape, or form that you can and whatever in whatever way that's meaningful to you. Wonder, beautiful. Jansara. It's a humbling task to define thirst. I, I think service is um listening to others and um empowering others to do, you know nurturing and empowering others to do their best, building their capacity to do better. I think, Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll say service is generosity to me and it's a responsibility. I thank you for being here to the audience. Thank you to the panel. Um, thank you, Chris, for inviting me. I, it was just a great experience and everybody out there, anybody interested in RISD serves, please contact us and join the committee, join the team. We wanna grow this into a movement in the school um, and outside the school so that we can help more and more of our communities. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much and good night, everyone. Thanks for the conversation. Thank you so much. Incredible dialogue. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here.